Good morning, good morning. Welcome to another week, studying Exodus. And this part here, I got kind of deep into it uh, because uh, the first plate is, uh, has some interesting factors to it that I wanted to explore. Uh, and so a lot of it is my theory, uh, but I think there's a, there's a little bit of uh, scripture that's uh, kind of, kind of uh, leans in that direction. We'll explore that. It's going to probably take two days for this particular section. So I'm going to shoot for the first uh, 15 through 28 today. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Help me, Lord, to be ever truthful to your word. Help me to be uh, ever, uh, whenever I speculate, Lord, please be a, a, a something that seems plausible to me when you're, and it's indicated by your word. Help me to keep always honest to your word. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. And whenever I go down these little trails, it's only because this is something I think about. I like to share it because uh, I think it, uh, it's fun to try to think about what life is going to be like, I think, in the future. Uh, we, you know, we spend uh, oh, about 80, 90 years on this uh in this first phase of our life uh, as uh, as mortals, and at at, uh, at the point of uh, either the rapture or our death, we're going to be uh, leaving this world and going to another world uh, with Jesus Christ, uh, and then we're going to receive in new bodies. It's interesting to know what those bodies were like when you go back to what uh, we, we got a couple of examples of what that's like, mainly from some of the early chapters of Genesis were prior to the fall of Adam and Eve. And then, of course, some things we learn about the Millennium Kingdom once we go into that uh, phase of our lives. Uh, so I think it's important. We're going to be spending a long time in, our, in, the, uh, in the new world than we are in this one. So I think it's fun to try to speculate a little bit. But the main topic today is actually the breastplate. And I'll just bring that in. And what we're talking about here is this device right here, a breastplate. And it's filled with 12 stones. And this is where I got kind of got on this idea of what the 12 stones and why stones? Uh, why stones at all? Uh, they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. But I think they may also give us a hint of something that uh, might be a future. Uh, use of uh, light, and and particularly colored light. We know that uh, it speaks. Uh, God talks quite a bit about light and the fact that He invented it. And it's not just like the sun, because He invented light before the sun was even built. So let's get some verses in here, and we'll start uh, exploring this idea of uh, the breastplate and light. So I'm actually going to stop off. I've always been fascinated with what seems to be what we were before the fall. Covers it, it covered it, uh, we were supposedly covered, as it seems, with light. Based on a statement by Adam and Eve about being naked. And it was back in uh, Genesis 3, 9 through 11. Adam and Eve make this funny statement to God. God called to Abraham, uh, Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? <laughs> And he said, here, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? So like prior to this, their clothing, for some reason they looked different. As soon as they fell and ate from that tree, there, something about them changed where they thought now that they're naked. And that theory is... Uh, is that they, they were clothed in light before that, and so the light disappeared. Well, it didn't disappear, but it diminished a lot. And Psalms 104, verse 2, kind of hints at this. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Now here the curtain associates light as a garment. And of course, garment would be like clothes. So then the fact that God created light uh, on the first day before even the sun, which was on the fourth day. And we see that in Genesis 1, 3 through 5, 
And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the, the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Uh, then jump into verse 14. This is talking about the fourth day. And this is when he invents the sun. So light, uh, light was invented even way before uh, sun was. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for uh, lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, that would be the moon, to make the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. <clears throat> and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So you see, he created light in the first day, but he didn't provide a source for the light until the fourth day. So light isn't just a component of the sun. Light is something all, uh, altogether by itself as an invention. Uh, by God. So this phenomenon we call light has so many fascinating properties that I believe uh, we are still discovering them. It's described as packets in one sense, uh, and also as waves, which are uh, as like a frequency in another sense, and both are true. Uh, very fascinating uh, thing, light. So let's look at this breastplate and its array of different colors and gems and realize that when you split up light, it becomes multiple colors. Let me just show you a couple of things. So here's a prism. And the idea being here is that when you put white light through a prism, it actually splits into the uh, multiple colors. I guess realize how blurry that is. Let's see if I got a better one than that. This is the actual bra, visible length of uh, the ultra of the light of the uh, of all frequencies, going all the way from uh, where radio bra broadcasts are, which is down in this end, and radar, microwaves, infrared, which you can't see. Most of these you can't see. As soon as we get to the visible light range, you got the, the different different lights, and they're all different frequencies. That's the important thing to remember. And then you get into ultraviolet light, which you can't see again in X-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays. And these are all different frequencies. So I guess I'm going to go more deep in, into this at the end, but uh, oh, tomorrow. But I just want to give you an idea about this idea of light and how it light, uh, visible light, white light we see is actually uh, all the colors put together. And when you split it, you can see the different colors. So we also got these gems, you know, which are all different colors. So these are the actual gems that are involved when it comes to the uh, breastplate. And so we're going to go through these uh, gems. That'll be mostly what we do today. And then I'll talk more about this idea of light tomorrow. Uh, and what I think it might have been prior to the fall. So back to the verses, Exodus 28, verse 15, six, uh, 15 through 17. Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work after the work of the uh, ephod. Thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, of purple, and scarlet, and fine twilled linen shall thou make it. Uh, this time when they're actually talking about the actual breastplate. I was thinking I should have got a better blown up picture of the breastplate. But what we're talking about here is this item here, right? Four square should be four four square. It shall be being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. That's another another new term for measurement. A span. A span is actually the distance from here, from your thumb, all the way to to your pinky. When your hand is outstretched, so it's a distance from here to here, and that comes out to about nine inches. 
So that's what a span is. So that's how wide that thing is. So you can figure it's about, well, it's a, it covers the, pretty much the whole chest and it's square. So it's also a span high. Now she'll set in the stone, uh, settings of stone, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be sardas and topaz, a cubuncle, and this shall be the first row. Let's go back to our stones. <laughs> So the first row. So the space from the end of the, uh, I mean, the first row. I also want to look at uh, Revelation. Uh, it's also mentioned in Revelation. Uh, and this is where the tie-in comes into this whole idea of light and what its use might be in the Millennium Kingdom. Uh, that's what I'm going to head to towards tomorrow. But let's just look at here in Revelation 21, 19 through 21. And this is where it's, uh, these same uh, stones come up again when it comes to what's in the breastplate. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, and the fourth an emerald. Uh, the fifth sardux, the sixth sardis, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth Chrysostomus, the eleventh Jasoth, the twelfth Amethyst. So that's why I wanted to uh, just show the uh, the tie-in between this breastplate and what I believe might be a representation of something in the uh, Millennium Kingdom, also. So let's take a look at these different colors, and now we're going to break them down uh, by row. So we mentioned the first row, and the first one in the first row is a Sardis. Or a ruby. Let's see if we can find it on our thing here. Uh, and uh, maybe I see in D8 and it should be the first. Oh, I don't see it there. Maybe I picked the wrong somebody else's theory about gemstones. Oh, oh in Hebrew, it's Odim. Well, to be read, I think it's this one here. But so they called it Sard on this particular one. <laughs> So I, and as Adam does in Persian, a beautiful gem of fine, deep red color with a mixture of purple. So I was probably just talking about this one here. So the first one for the first uh, son was Reuben. So that's the, that's correct. So the Sardis, this would be the ruby, the ruby here. Uh, it's all the places in in uh, in the Bible where it mentions this in Job twenty eight eighteen. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. Proverbs 3.15. She is more precious, precious than rubies, and on all the things they cannot desire are not to be compared unto her. Proverbs 8.11. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Proverbs 31.10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? So some places that rubies are mentioned in the Bible. And that last one has to be a statement made during the uh, uh, during the, the uh, Sabbat, uh, the uh, Sabbath dinner. Uh, okay, the next one is topaz or pitdath. It's constantly rendered, rendered by the LXX or the Vulgate as uh, Tobazius, which agrees with Josephus. The topaz is a precious stone of pale dead green with a mixture of yellow, sometimes of a finer, fine yellow, and hence called crystallite by the moderns from its gold color. Uh, so let's see if we can find uh, topaz here in our list. And that was three rows of four. So I wonder how this thing was set up. So 
they're dead, uh, of a pale dead green color. I guess I should have uh, written down the names of the actual list of, uh, I thought I got a good picture of them, but I didn't, I didn't check these names against what I had written down. But a mixture of yellow. I think it's going in this order. Let me go back to uh, I know it's the uh, it's the twelve tribes in order. First one should be Sardis, Topaz, and Cubuncle. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to get a list of the. Uh... I think I got a list of the uh, actual tribes. Ruben, Sibian, Levi. Okay, let's see how this thing works with the first three sins. Okay, now I got how they're going. So they're going in reverse order from what I believe. This is the first row across the top. So Ruby and Simeon and Levi. So this middle one is the uh, one we're talking about. And they call that Peridot on here. But I can kind of see how it's got a green color or maybe a little yellow mixed in. Okay, back to uh, my verses. So verses on this in Job 28:19. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. And they shall bear their names before Jehovah upon his two shoulders, the place of strength for a memorial. That's the other thing you got to realize that this, this device is actually attached to those shoulder uh, plates we were talking about on Friday. Uh, I went to the wrong page. The okay, next one is a cubuncle. Baccarat is another name for it. And from Barak to light glitter, a very elegant gem of a deep red color with a mixture of scarlet. But that sure doesn't look like that one, does it? Isaiah 54, 11 and 12. I just keep going. It also talks about this particular gem. All thou afflicted, tossed with the tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundation with sapphires. And I will make the windows of the gates and the gates of the cubuncle and all the borders of pleasant stones. Then uh, under verse 18, we'll get to the next row. The second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. I am definitely going to look for a different uh, picture. This is getting very confusing, and it's not working. So bear with me for a second.
see what I go through to try to find these pictures I get all the time. <laughs> Like that one I had to do with that. Oh well, I give up. It's gonna to take too long. I don't want this thing to turn into a uh, hour video. <laughs> I don't see diamond there at all. <laughs> that could be an emerald because it, turquoise does look a little bit like an emerald, I think. I'm sorry, folks. Let's just continue. Yeah, and I'll put uh, one of the other things back up. An emerald, uh, same with the ancient uh, Samagadras, one of the most beautiful of all the gems and of a bright green color without any mixture. We also see this in Ezekiel 27, 16. Syria was the merchant by reason of the multitude of her wares of the making. They occupied in affairs with emeralds, purple embroidered work and fine linen and coral and a gate. So it seems like emeralds may have come from Syria. Next is a sapphire, a precious stone, apparently of a bright blue color. Speaking of what God knows, in Job 28, 6, the stones of it are placed, are in the place of sapphires and have dust of gold. And also verse 16, it cannot be valued with gold of Ophar, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. Uh, Speaking of a loved one in so, uh, Song of Sol Songs in 514, his hands are as gold rings set with the barrel, and his belly is a bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. And also speaking of God on his throne, mentions it in Ezekiel 126. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of sapphire stones. And upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man above it. Uh, also in Ezekiel 10.1, Then I looked and beheld in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims. There appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And also in Revelation 4.3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Okay, so the next one, and that row is a diamond. Uh, one more in, uh, one more in uh, verse on uh, a gem of crystallized carbon, the most valued and brilliant of the precious stones, remarkable in its for its hardness. This is Marison mentioned in Jeremiah 17:1. The sin of Judea is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond, it is graven upon the tool of their heart and upon the irons of your altars. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 13 and 14. This has been, uh, thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was a covering. The sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the barrel and the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the cucumber, and gold. The workmanship of the tabrets and all the pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. That's actually the one verse of a description of Satan before his fall, when he was Lucifer. It was a beautiful, most one of the most beautiful of the angels. Probably why pride kicked in and he, he became, uh, wanted to be like God.
Okay, on to verse 19. Oh, I wasn't finished with uh, that. Speaking of uh, back to Lucifer, I mean, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so that thou was upon the holy mountain of God, and thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. So again, I was speaking of Lucifer. Now on to verse 19. That whole stone thing messed me up a little bit. I'm sorry. I apologize, folks. <laughs> In the third row, a liguire and a gate and an amethyst. So let's look at these. So a liguire, that's Hebrew for Leshlem, a precious stone, the first in the third row of the high priest's breastplate. It's impossible to say with any certainty what stone is denoted by the Hebrew term, but perhaps the tourmaline, or more definitely the red variety known as rubellite, has better claims than any other mineral. Rubellite is a hard stone and used as a gem and is sometimes sold for a red sapphire. Didn't have any verses on that one. And then going to the uh, gate, the gate, we see it over in Isaiah 54, 10 through 13. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall never depart from thee, neither shall thy covenant of peace be removed, saith the Lord have mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempests and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. And I will make thy windows of thy gates and the gates of thy cucumbers and all the borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of all thy children. I think this is the speed of the millennium kingdom again. So a gate, a beautifully veined, semi-transparent precious stone, a variety of quartz. Its colors are delicately arranged in stripes or bands or blended in clouds. The next one was mentioned was amethyst. In Hebrew, it's uh, eklamai, a subspecies of quartz of a bluish violet color. Mention is made of this precious stone, which formed the third in the third row of the high priestly breastplate. It occurs also in Revelation 21 20. The fifth, sardox, the sixth, sardis, the seventh, crystallite, and the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, crispalius, and the eleventh, adjacent and the twelfth in Amethyst. Uh, okay, on to verse 20. In the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. So a barrel, some other verses on this one, Ezekiel 116. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of barrel. They had four and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. That's from our Ezekiel study, also Ezekiel 10, 9, which I think we read once already. And when I looked, and behold, the four wheels of the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub, another wheel by one cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was the color of a barrel stone. Also Daniel 10, 6. His body also was like barrel, and his face is the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire. His arms and his feet like the color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Mm -hmm. Now, in Revelation 21 20, it also mentions it there. Uh, so, the barrel is in that list there. I won't read it again. Barrel, a Hebrew for Tarshish, is generally supposed that the Tarshish derives its name from the place it's so called in Spain. This is where. Uh, uh, Jonah wanted to escape to, if you remember. Beryl is a mineral of great hardness and when transparent of much beauty. By Tarshish, the modern yellow topaz is. Probably intended, while in Revelation 21.20, a different stone is perhaps referred to, probably the mineral now called beryl, which is identical with the emerald except in color being a light green or bluish green. And the next one mentioned is an onyx. I see that also in Ezekiel, I mean, Exodus 28, 9. Thou shalt take two onyx stones, engrave on them the names of the children of Israel. Those are the two that are on the shoulders. The onyx is not a transparent stone, but as the color of, a, of the flesh appears through the nail. 
It's a Greek onyx on a human body, so the reddish mass, which is below, shines delicately through the whitish surface of the onyx. There are seven, several rare varieties also. Uh, white and reddish stripes alternating from the sardix, white and reddish gray, the, the chancedony. When polished, it has a fine luster and easily wrought into a gem of great beauty. Next is the jasper. That's also mentioned in Revelation 4, 3. And he that sat, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and on sardine and stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like under an emerald. This, uh, that was the, uh, the throne room of God and what he looked like uh, sitting on the throne. Also in Revelation 21, 11, having the glory of God and her light was like under a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. Also jumping down to verse 18 through 20. And the building of the wall of as, as it was of Jasper and the city was pure gold like under clear glass. And the foundation of the wall of the city was garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper. I won't read through them all again. We just did that. But that's the foundations. We'll talk more about those uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Also, uh, oh, verse 20, it shows it, the rest of the uh, foundation. A precious stone frequently noticed in Scripture. It was the last of the 12 inserted in the high priest's breastplate and the first of the 12 used in the foundations of the New Jerusalem. That's what we saw there in uh, verse 19. The first foundation wall was Jasper. Uh, so the characteristics of the stone as far as they are specified in Scripture, Revelation 21, 11, Uh, that it was most precious and like crystal. We may also infer from Revelation 4, 3, that it was a stone of brilliant and transparent light. The stone which we name Jasper does not, does not accord with the, this description. There can be no doubt that the diamond would more adequately answer to the description uh, in the book of Revelation. So that one we saw in verse 11. The light was like under a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. But that doesn't really uh, describe the, the current jasper stone. So most likely what they're describing here is diamond, is what, is, what the, this note is saying. So I'm going to stop there for today. Oh, no, I'm just going to read through. Uh, sorry. Stop at 29. And the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel. 12 according to their names, like the engraving of a signet. Everyone with his name shall thou be according to the 12 tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of the wreathen work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shalt put the two rings on the two sides of the breastplate. And thou shalt take the two wreathen two wreathing chains of gold and the two rings, which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the, uh, other, uh, of the two uh, wreathing chains, thou shalt fasten in the two ounces and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod. So if you can imagine these chains were actually attached here on a ring. You see my cursor. And it ran up to the uh, ephod on top of the shoulder. Uh, I mean, it went up to the uh, shoulder piece I what that was good, of the ephod before it. And that's where it attached. And it did, uh, did that on both sides. That's what it's describing there. Verse 26. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate, and the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. So those are these two rings down at the bottom here. It's describing. And the two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the fore part thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curtis girdle of the ephod. So they're talking about those two rings being down here, uh, towards this uh, kind of like a belt. They're calling it a girdle. And there's going to be a little blue piece of, uh, of, of uh, satin silk uh, between the breastplate and there to attach it. So it's so it stays in one place. 
and they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue that may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. So it's primarily going to be attached to the top. When you take it off, uh, you take it off by removing the bottom pieces. That's basically what that is saying. So we're going to stop there and uh, pick up here tomorrow at verse 29. So let's end with a prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for that time that we were able to uh, study your word, Lord. And thank you, Lord, to help me to better be prepared. Uh, and Thank you, Lord, for helping me through this lesson. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Now, sorry about that delay. It probably made it a little bit longer. But uh, uh, I will try to, I'll actually try to find that, that those actual stones so you can see them, a, a better representation of them someplace for tomorrow. So you guys all have a great day, and we'll see you again tomorrow.